Mary Botmus, did Santa bring you all the fights you wanted this year? By now you already know the spiel, but just in case, if you haven't seen this week's episode of BattleBots, make sure you watch it now. This is your final warning before we go into all sorts of spoilers. This week we hear from newcomer Slapbox when he asks himself, Why me? When he finds out he has to fight Tombstone in his season debut, we hear from the new all all new Walker 500 pounds of insanity chomp, and we also hear from the now undefeated Bloodsport. I'm Will Bales from Hypershock. We're Mike and Andrea Galately from Team Witch Doctor. And this is a Tale of the Tape after show. Welcome to the Tale of the Tape After Show. We have a lot to get into this episode, so let's jump right into that 30 second recap. 30 seconds on the clock! This week we saw Slapbox get its wheels slapped off in its debut fight against King of Kinetic Energy, Tombstone. We saw Slamo finally get its first televised win in 20 years by building a robot that is, quote, not crap. And Scorpios bullies an 11 year old. Tyler wins some, Tyler loses some. Ribot takes the bait and gets distracted by Mad Catter's nuisance bot. Ribot loses a mini bike race to Mad Catter. And a 500 pound freaking walking robot, Chomp. Woo! Yet another contested judge's decision between Shatter and Malice. And Bloodsport outlasts Endgame's magic smoke reserves. Let's start tonight's deep dives with a look at Slapbox. Slapbox is a robot that's new to BattleBots, but the team has been around BattleBots for a while. They've actually been part of Team Gemini. Um, and while Slapbox is new to the televised uh, combat robotics world, it did get its start at Robot Ruckus, which is an event that's uh, very close to our hearts. It's here uh, in South Florida, in Orlando, and it's run by Maker Faire Orlando. And it's actually a place where a lot of robots get their start. And a lot of more seasoned teams go to practice in between seasons. So it's where Shatter got its start. We've seen Extinguisher. We've seen Axe Backwards. Um, a lot of robots get their practice there. So that's where we met Slapbox for the first time. We're excited to see them on TV. So here's a team to tell us more about Slapbox. Team Slapbox here with Hunter, Dominic, Bryce, Cynthia, Annika. We started off in the one pound weight class. Once we were comfortable with that, we moved to 30 pound and built a few different designs. When it became time to apply for battle bots, we used my brother Hunter's idea to, to base around Slapbox. We specifically chose his design because it was the most kid friendly to operate and test. On season four of BattleBots, I was a driver for Gemini. So when season five came around, I got the offer to be a driver again, as well as co-captain Gemini. Well, we had already had plans and were made, had already made the first version of Slapbox by that point and applied for BattleBots. And I saw it as an opportunity to be able to get not only my whole family on the show, but be able to have myself be involved as a driver. Hunter was able to be a driver on Gemini and Bryce could take over captaining and driving a uh, slap box. What we weren't prepared for when we decided to run two teams was just the pure chaos with just a few of us, uh, you know, trying to build what kind of became to be around six robots because we had three setups for slap box, you know, between full frames and the motors and gearboxes and all the parts and pieces for that, as well as uh, enough for at least three Geminis uh, that we had to process and go through. Yeah, it was very crazy. We had to basically maintain three robots because, you know, two Gemini and slap box. And from our first fights, it was a lot of work we had to do. It was a ton. We had more than we had expected because we had to inspect the bot after the match. Here I have part of the frame from the tombstone fight of Slapbox, uh, where you can see it in the video where it's kind of peeled out at the end of the fight. So this is our right side of the chassis. Uh, Slapbox how it's able to kind of be so strong and tank some of those hits from Tombstone without having catastrophic internal failure is the whole entire robot is a unibody where everything is tied together in some way. And how we kind of tie that together beyond bolts is with lowered and raised portions, or as I call them, castles, uh, throughout 
the frame on all pieces uh, of the bottom, the top plates, the gearbox inside, different support pillars that we have internally of the bot. Uh, in the tombstone fight, we took a direct front hit to our face and it really only peeled back, you know, maybe five, six inches of the frame because it has to go through every single castle as well as shearing bolts and, you know, anything that else that may be in contact with that. In the tombstone fight, we took no internal damage. The only damage we did take was the wedges, the panel that got peeled off on the right side of our chassis, and this axle. After getting the bot back to the pits, we took out all the internals and transplanted them into one of our spare frames. We put in some new axles and new wheels and we were ready for the next match. Some fun facts that most people may not know about our team is that my kids are very involved and they actually do build uh, the robots with us and can actually operate a lot of the equipment. They all around can 100% on their own build the robot themselves. Obviously, it always helps to have somebody more experienced. Uh, my background is just mechanical maintenance. I'm uh, not trained in any way other than uh, welding. And I, I just think it's awesome that, you know, through a lot of trial error and effort and work that, you know, I was able to teach my kids skills that they'll hopefully have with them for the rest of their lives to do whatever they decide to do in the future. It's just I don't know, it's an awesome feeling. And for what good? Now look, look at this! Tombstone's coming oh, into the mini box! No, please, no, please, no! I didn't want my favorite mini bot paint job to get destroyed by Tombstone. Next is Chomp. Uh, we, we are not qualified, we are not smart enough to describe anything about Chomp, so I think we're just going to go straight to the team themselves. Chomp has had a lot of forums over the years. First, she was a crusher, and, which didn't do very well at all in the style of many first battle bots. And then a wheeled hammer bot, which is probably how a lot of y'all got to know her. And then now, Chomp is a walker uh, with a turret. We decided to make a walker for several reasons. One is it actually really helps us because of the weight bonus to have 500 pounds for a hammer robot. A problem that we had with Chomp 2, Hammer Chomp, is that she would throw herself in the air when she would hammer, and then most of the energy, or a large percentage of the energy that we were putting into the hammer swing would go into lifting the robot up instead of pounding our opponent down. With a heavier robot, we stay on the ground more and we can hit harder. Another reason, though, to build a walker is because walking robots are hard and cool, and We've never been sort of like the simple road kind of team. I think that is really motivating, I think, to everyone on this team. We're so lucky to have a huge team of motivated people is that we're trying to push the envelope and build something new um, and hard and exciting. And a walker is that. Hi, I'm Yasha, and I'm going to talk about how one of Chomp's leg modules works. Uh, all of the leg actuation on Chomp is pneumatic. Um, each leg has three degrees of freedom. The biggest one is uh, swing, where the leg moves forward and back in this axis. Uh, the second biggest is lift, which lifts the leg up and down. And the last is the toe curl, which is a small axis. And it's not a simple pivot like the other two. It's part of a four bar system, and that's so that when the lift axis moves the legs up and down, the foot remains vertical, just a simple parallel, parallel four bar. Uh, without that, the tip of the toe would dive under as you lower the lift and swing out as you lift it. We didn't want to deal with that. Um, so there's three simple uh, pneumatic cylinders driving each axis. Uh, you can probably see the um, swing cylinder here, and they're just slightly modified commercial off-the-shelf, uh, you know, piston and rod setups. Uh, those are controlled by uh, infield uh, servo pneumatic systems. There's three of them on, on each leg. Each one controls one of the axes. To coordinate that, we have our own custom leg board, which um, 
supplies uh, feedback to the infields. They, they're designed for industrial automation, zero to 10 volt, and we couldn't find any of those type of uh, feedback uh, sensors that fit inside of this thing. Instead, we use tiny little angle sensors, which are hiding inside the joints, hiding from spinners. Um, but the uh, leg board that we designed uh, listens to communications from the central controller and listens to the sensors inside of the, the joints and feeds all that back to the infield system and the infield closes the loop on each, on each axis. Here is a partially disassembled leg module. You can see the three infield S2 cylinder positioning systems that run the cylinders and then you can see one of the cylinders. You can see it's sort of just a simple actuator. This is the leg board that takes input from the main computer on the hull and tells the three end fields what to do. We were not using our full speed in our first match. And there are two reasons. The first one is Tom's just never gonna be that fast. Walking is not gonna compete with wheels. We're never gonna chase anyone down. There's not that much of a point. And so we just kind of got to wait for them to come, or come to us and then hammer them really hard. But the other reason is I didn't want to run out of air. Even with the largest SCBA tank that we could get our hands on, we only have enough air for about three minutes of middling speed walking. And it would be so sad to fight a great fight and then not be able to walk and move because we're out of air and lose the match. The maximum speed that I've gotten Chomp walking with our current software um, leg control is probably twice what you saw in that match. Theoretically, Chomp should be able to walk something on the order of six miles an hour, which is fast. That's like a human jogging. Um, we've never really realized that because the infields, we haven't been able to get the infield control to be to stable at that uh repetition rate, which is reasonable. They don't make any claims that you should be able to do that. It's a really difficult control problem. But uh, hopefully with a little bit of finagling, we can actually get Chomp to walk closer to that speed. This season, we absolutely designed Chomp, as we have in the past, to have both auto-targeting and auto-chomp, which is automatic camera firing, as functions available to the weapons operator on a dead man switch. Both of those relied on a little LiDAR that looked out in a fan array of, of beams and used a filter to look for and solve for position and velocity of the object we thought was most likely to be our opponent. Super duper sadly, and you can read a little more about this in our post coming on Instagram and Facebook, when we actually put the hull and the turret all together the night before we were down at BattleBots for the first time. We had a mystery problem where this armor that protects our hammer sprockets and drivetrain interfered somehow with the lighter returns. We super carefully positioned the lighter down below the armor and modeled all the view frustra of the emitter uh, and the sensor to make sure that nothing would interfere with it. And yet, Something about this configuration was bad, and we couldn't get that sensor working. Composite armor off. You can see this is the main axle that does throw on this side and retract on this side with two big cylinders in the back. And this is where the LiDAR would be, right in the middle of this gap hanging down below the armor, but it is not there. So sad. We had to choose between armoring the heart of the turret and using the LiDAR. So we took the LiDAR off and all the, all the turret operation was done by our weapons operator, Yasha Little, um, who we think did a very nice job. But uh, we were very, very sad because one of the things that we want to do more of is get the human out of the loop. On our third deep dive tonight, which is actually the main event fight for this episode, uh, we're going to hear from team captain of Bloodsport, Justin Marple, about the new and improved Bloodsport. Hey, Tale of the Tape. Thanks so much for having us on. I'm a big fan of the show. Um, I'm Justin, and I'm very excited to talk to you about the new version of Bloodsport, so let's get into it. Um, so Bloodsport's a very different bot this year. 
Um, we really took everything we learned from the first season of BattleBots and tried to redesign um, from the ground up. And um, yeah, there's three key areas we focused on this, this season. We focused on the chassis design, we focused on the self-writing mechanism, and then we focused on the weapon system. Um, so starting with the chassis, chassis design, um, here I actually have a Bloodsport V1 uh, prototype chassis. And there's some good things to say about this. Um, there is, there's no obvious weak points anywhere. It's all well protected. Um, there's no edges for someone like Tombstone to catch. Um, but there is some things to be desired here. So uh, if the weapon were to ever die with a design like this, there's no way to really push someone around. Um, we can't really control the match after that point. We're just kind of done. Um, a second point is because if someone gets under us, and lift the chassis up. Since the wheels are inside the chassis, it's very easy for us to lose traction altogether, and then the other bot can just push us around and you know, wears along for the ride at that point. Um, and the third problem is kind of similar in that the wheels are so close together, when this weapon is spinning up, the, the chassis gets very skittish. There's not much control. There's not like, there's no, there's no drivability with it. Um, so um, to solve these problems, we came up with this, the Bloodsport V2 prototype chassis. And um, you'll, you'll see how this solves a, uh, several of these problems. So for instance, in the front, uh, we have mounts for the forks and wedgelets. Um, with, in the back, we actually extended the, the wheels. And what that does is if, if we get pushed upwards, the wheels still contact the ground so we can still maneuver backwards, uh, rotate, do something to get out of a, get out of a bad situation. Um, and thirdly, because these wheels are so far apart so far out we get a lot more maneuverability much more dry especially when this thing is like spinning up uh i think the scorpio's fight was a pretty good example of that um being able to maneuver while things are spinning up and doing you know just crazy torques on the chassis and things like that um so this uh so one one more thing uh the wheels so we we made new wheels this year so this is the bloodsport v1 wheels um they're colson's you can see they're they're they have decent grip okay durability but we had to screw in into the aluminum hub so these things wouldn't spin um which wasn't ideal it's a little sketchy so we came up with these wheels um these if you compare them they're quite a bit different they're much more much beefier um, we can adjust the durability or the durometer of these wheels so they can be either softer or harder depending on who we're fighting if you want more grip or more durability um and yeah so for the second big concept uh, that we were working on is the self writing pole. So here we got self writing pole. What's what's going on here? Is this kind of craziness, right? Like why is it curved? Um, so to explain this, I also have a gigabyte pole with me. Um, and what what's how does this work? So you have the chassis here, the ground here. So as this thing hits the ground, this is applying a big torque. It's, a, it's a basically a big lever, and it's applying a giant torque. And as it goes up, the torque lessens and it topples itself back over. But at the very beginning, there's a huge, huge torque requirement. And that's bad for our bot because uh, our weapon system has four, four motors and they're all geared for speed. Um, we want to get that 250 mile per hour uh, tip, tip speed limit. And um, yeah, if we lose one motor, that's a lot of torque to be lost. And uh, if we lose two motors, that's a lot of torque to be lost. So. Uh, we want to we want to be able to be redundant with all our systems, and one way of doing that is using something like this. So the idea here is we start upside down, and we slowly move ourselves or kind of fling ourselves over, and basically that instead of a, a large torque spike and coming back down, we now have a much flatter torque requirement, and that makes it much easier for only two motors to uh, self-write with instead of needing all four right at the beginning and then you know the torque torque drops off quite fast. Um, and now for the third third big topic we were uh, we've been working on, uh, I'm going to bring it over to Nick to talk to you about the weapon blades. Hey, I'm Nick. I do the weapon design for the team, and I also built Thumb War, our mini bot from last year. We have five blades for this season, each one designed for a different kind of fight. The tri-bar is our first and heaviest one, designed to deliver the biggest hits while still being fully stable. Next is the thick bar. This one is designed to survive vertical impacts, which is why we used it against Endgame. That one also has a pair of stabilizer fins to help keep it level. 
Third, we have the disc. This one doubles as our top armor, with the rim protecting our bot from all sides even when it's not spinning, which is why we brought it out for the Scorpios match. After that, we have our two blades from last year. There's the key, which is our lightest weapon, but also the second thickest. We'd probably use this one against a compact drum spinner like Minotaur, where we don't need as much reach. Last but not least is the long bar that we used in all of our fights last year, which has the most reach and also the most aggressive tooth profile, making it good at digging into armor. We also added stabilizer fins to this one since last season. We're also doing a video series about each of these blades with more detail about the design, so be sure to check that out. This week's Chris Roast of the Night is another Kenny smack. Uh, I don't know what Chris and Kenny have going on, but uh, just take a look. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you never did the gamesmanship thing as you were getting ready to go into the octagon, did you? Not really. I always brought the same body to oh. my fights. Yeah. I thought you were like Mr. Potato Head. You'd put on a different <laughs> nose, different ears. If, I wish. If so, you picked, be nice. you picked the wrong ones. <laughs> Just going to let you know. He calls it Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> he called him Mr. Potato Head. With the nose on the end. <laughs> now it's time for the Behind the Bots fan question of the week. Hi, everyone. This is Kyle with the Behind the Bots podcast with this week's big fan question. This question comes from Jesse Mullen, who asks, Why does Chomp, and every other hammer bot for that matter, jump when they fire their hammer? Surely they're heavy enough to stay on the ground. Great question, Jesse. Looking forward to hearing the answer. Oh, I got this one. So, okay, so you basically have a whole no, bunch no, of... No, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me stop you right what? there. We're going to we're gonna throw this a technical tier. I was just going to answer no, it. no, no. no. Technical T-Rex, technical T-Rex, the T in T-Rex stands for technical. You've probably heard of Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For hammer bots, like Chomp and Shatter, this is best exemplified any time they swing their hammer. Hammer bots have to swing their weapon quickly enough to cause damage by the time it hits their opponent. Unlike spinning weapons, hammers require the energy of the swing to be put into the weapon all at once, in a rapid acceleration, enabled by a large force from electric motors or pneumatic actuators. Firing these weapons requires so much force that the entire robot lifts in the air from the power of the swing. In other words, the resultant force on the robot from swinging their hammer is greater than the gravitational force keeping them on the ground. Teams have tried several methods to combat this problem, most commonly using magnets. Chomp, Shatter, and Beta have all incorporated magnets this year to increase their downforce in an effort to stick to the floor. Even with magnets, Shatter and Chomp still swing so hard that they jump every time they fire their hammer. Wow, thanks Technical T-Rex. That was both intelligent and concise. I could be intelligent and concise. For this episode's Thing of the Week. Fan Art of the Week. Not bad. We have been seeing some amazing fan art on Facebook and social media, so I'm really happy to get a chance to, to share some of that. Yeah, first off, um, Caleb Kempson, who actually illustrated your book, uh, has posted a series of colored pencil drawings of this year's robots. We also saw some unbelievable paintings from Angie Dudorino, which turned BattleBots into fine art. Flying fine art. And despite not having an audience at filming this year, we've seen fans post some incredible signs cheering on their favorite bots. So that's this week's Tale of the Tape episode. Uh, there's no bo battle bots this week between Christmas and New Year's, so I, I don't know, take a walk, uh, build, build a robot. But before you do, uh, take your hat off if it's your custom. And, um, you know, let's, let's watch some dead robots.
You got a hat here. That's cute. Thank you. That's Should it. have like a mohawk or something under this. Another hat. <laughs> oh, oh my god. Another hat. All right, all right. <laughs> Get another hat. I do have a whole box of hats. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, you can't, you can't see, see it at all. <laughs> oh no, yeah, it's totally fine, right? That was great. <laughs> You said the word slap box a lot of slap, times, slap, but slap. otherwise it's fine. I could put a counter on the screen slap. for like every slap. <laughs> slap, 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 slap.